We left off at encouraging new doc committers to mentor even more new doc committers. Okay. The first item on here is Annotator JS. I've talked to some people on the mailing list about this. And what it does is allow people to enter annotations like post-it notes on an existing website. And now I'm going to do the computer equivalent of hold my beer and watch this, the live demonstration. I start my Apache web server fearlessly on this machine. Uh, that's good enough. And I switch to my Firefox. I need somebody to help me out here and say the obvious thing, right? I can see the wires. Yeah, no, never mind. All right, I go to the bookmark I set earlier. This is all just local on this machine. This is a, a section of the handbook on wireless, which I think is an ideal example of what needs to be reviewed. Uh, I will not go over to the side there where you can't see it. I'll go over here. Uh, infrastructure mode. Notice that this is in italics. Let's say we have a group of people that we've asked to review this chapter. They go to a website, and they say, I need to make a comment about where it says infrastructure mode there. This JavaScript thing lets me enter a comment. And then it, yeah, it's fairly visible there. The yellow shows you that there has been a comment made on that particular part of the code. Multiple people can review this page and make comments. What I would like to do is say, OK, for a limited period of time, let's say a week, maybe two weeks, we are asking a group of people to review this particular section of the documents and make comments on it. And at the end of that time, the person who held the review, which in this case would be me, will go through those comments and edit them, commit them. They will be handled within a week. And I, I say that because unlike a PR, a PR has no deadline. It doesn't go away, and the user doesn't get any feedback. With this, there would be a short-term turnaround, so there is some assurance that the comments you make will be handled. Now notice that this is the rendered version of this page. You don't see any DocBook XML. You don't need to know anything about the markup. All you're concerned with as a reviewer is the content. And uh, people, multiple people can comment on things. Let's say wireless network. And this particular application is in JavaScript. And it's a free open source application. However, those comments are saved in, in memory. So if I refresh this page, they're gone. This, uh, to save those, save the uh, annotations, they call them, to save those permanently, you need a database plugin that works with their JavaScript. And remember, in the same way I talked about docs that were missing a minimal config, these guys are missing a minimal config. Oh, it's just throw this line into your HTML, and then the rest of it, you, kinda, you need a PyJWT, which I did with the help of Kubes, I did a port of. And you need a port of this, uh, you need this software that gives you a database backend on your computer that talks to the Python web server, which uses PyFlask, or it was. It's a mishmash of, it's like how XSLT was explained, is you really need to know XSLT to understand it. And this is very much the same way. It's missing a minimal working config. And I assume that I could even run this on my own server. We could have people attend it there uh, if it was set up. Or Annotator, the group, I believe it's annotatorjs.org, they have a, if you sign up for a security token with them, they can host it on their servers, I think. It's all very fuzzy to me. But uh, the point is, with some technical help, we could make this work, and we could start holding reviews. Remember that because it's in a browser, you're not limited to just the DocBook stuff. We have HTML rendered versions of our man pages. So we could review that, and this 
eliminates that, that need to know anything at all about the markup. And so I think it's ideal for short-term events. We could say to people, uh, the XORG chapter really needs review. Actually, it really needs to be rewritten. The wireless chapter is an excellent example of one that needs to be reviewed. First off, it's complete. It's, it's really complete. It's got way too much stuff in it that is mentioned early and shouldn't be. But also, there's, there are things that have changed, I'm sure. Uh, recently, I added this uh, quick start because that's the question most people are asking when they go to the wireless chapter is how do I set up my wireless adapter to get onto this network? They don't care usually at that point about EEP and LEAP and PEEP and, and uh, uh, WPA Enterprise and all that stuff. And yet, the original form of this chapter, it was just a, uh, a dictionary. Here are all these terms, and then about three quarters of the way through, here is how you set up WPA to connect to a network, which is the first question most people are asking. And in a review, that would be something that hopefully somebody would point out. So this is another thing where we need some technical help with it. And it's one of those where it's probably not that bad to set up if you're a Python web developer that's used to PyJWT and maybe Flask and maybe Elasticsearch, which they use for a database. Uh, it may not be a big deal for somebody. But again, remember, the if, if it was easy, somebody would have already done it. So there, there needs to be a confluence of people who work in FreeBSD with those things. So please, let's do this, because this is easy, hopefully, easy to use, and is ideal from the point of the user, because they don't care about our markup, many of them, and it would allow them to contribute. Uh, having a deadline on it would give them quick feedback for what they've put in, or at least some assurance that the work they've gone to to annotate things would be acted on uh, here do things like this and say, I'll add a note to that one and save it. And then at the end, the idea is with the database back end, you just go through all the annotations and it would show you where they are in context on there because you can see them and act on those. This is the kind of, of stuff we need to be using. Uh, looking at source for the documents is fine, but most people, most users now are not going to be motivated to do that. So if anyone wants to help with this, please contact me. Uh, if we don't, I, I did ask on the developers list, but I think it got uh, sort of overlooked because of another thing I was asking about. It doesn't matter. Uh, if somebody wants to help, great. If not, after another short period of time, this is another thing I could see us asking the foundation to help with. Any questions on this before I switch away from it? There are various types of plugins for this annotator where you can have usernames, you can require login. You don't have to require login. Uh, so there's various ways to set it up. But they even have some interaction so you can annotate PDF files, which I, I shouldn't say PDF files, PDFs, uh, which I find kind of interesting because that could be useful to us also. Any questions? Annotator, uh, annotatorjs.org is, I believe, their, their website. Yes. And they have another, they have a website for the project, and they have another for the group, and it's all, there's a bunch of stuff. This one actually, see it change there? It's being edited right now, uh, being annotated right now. I hope nobody's put in anything bad. But uh, with the other plugins, they have ones that will tell you what user wrote that. And I could see that being very important for us. Uh, but yes, this, I love this idea. I mean, it's perfect for reviews where we can have source committers look at uh, man pages, say, on the FreeBSD website, the, the HTML rendered versions, and say, we don't care about the markup. Is the content of this thing, does it still work the way it did when this page was written five years ago? Help us out with it. And they don't need to try and read through DocBook XML files or, 
or man.doc files. Yeah, I look at this and go, this is, I mean, yeah, granted, like in the, uh, the vendor summit, somebody's going to write snarky jokes, which is fine. Uh, if they're having fun with it and they do some other contributions also, no problem. That's great. And you see up here at the top, it does show, it, it does have some options to do things. But anyway, I want to point this out. This is sort of the next generation stuff we should be looking at because it's out there, it's free. The work that needs to be done is plugging it in to use it on our stuff. Let's do that. Let's get people involved with an easy thing like this. Okay, any other questions on this before we move on? Okay. Uh, oops, did I lose my place on my presentation? No, I don't think so. I just have to go back to it. Submissions by non-committers. Uh, we have several forms of those, and they don't really fly very well. People say, oh, uh, here's my translated version of a document. Here you go. It's like, well, we can't really do anything with it. Uh, sorry, we really appreciate all the effort you put into that, but it's wasted because we don't have a way to use it. That, that would be just for the translations. We often have people submit documents like, not a man page exactly, but like, oh, I've, I've written this thing about this. Here you go. We need to have something, some sort of introduction for people who want to contribute but get scared off by the, the primer, which is, it's a book. I mean, I don't want to read a whole book. I, I, I've gone out of my way to help you by doing some, writing some little instructions. Help me get that to you, but don't make me work harder because I've already volunteered effort to write it. And another thing that we could really benefit from is cross-pollination with other projects. Uh, yesterday at the Vendor Summit, Justin was talking about uh, FreeBSD people going to non-FreeBSD events. And I know Drew and I have done that for documentation stuff, and we learned stuff. It was neat because the other people there say, you know, we have this problem, and we've, we've done this, and it's not really a very good solution, and we're not happy with it. And sometimes one of the other people, maybe even us, can say, oh, hey, we had that problem too, and we got around it by doing this, and it worked fairly well, but we have this problem with our stuff. And so that interchange is really, it, uh, it's like a hybrid. You get the information you had, but you also get information from the others. And there is less, uh, in general, everybody out there on other groups is very accepting and friendly. There is no hostility from the Linux users, that, and we aren't hostile to them. I mean, that we should make that clear that we, we're snarky, but it's like a, a sibling rivalry. It's not, it's not serious uh, issues. And there is information to be gained there, and I encourage you, I mean, ask the foundation. They do travel grants. They're in favor of it. If you have the time and can go to an event, uh, for instance, the Open Help Conference is a documentation event that this year will be held in September. It's in Cincinnati, which if, you, if you've never been to Cincinnati, it's a great town. I, I had never been there and went to it. It's like, wow, this is cool. It's a great event. It's different every time because the number of attendees, the first time I went was like 12. So you might think that wouldn't work very well, but it was actually like a very close, like sitting around a campfire type talk. And the next time there were 25 or so, and it was, it was more like a BSD can, but it was still small, and you could talk to each other, and it was, it was different, but it was also great. And Sean, who runs it, he's the guy who wrote ITS Tool. He is, uh, I'm not sure of his exact title, but he's like the GNOME documentation Puba or something. Did he? Yeah. Oh, well, he was. But he's, he runs a very nice event. I mean, it's, it's classy. They, uh, they have gizmos they give out, which like this I'm still using is from the one I went to in 2012, which is a magnetically closed notebook with Post-it. No, a notebook in the old sense, the manual word processor. You use like a stylus with ink in it. All right, anyway. And it has post-it notes of various sizes and colors. 
I'm still using this. It's awesome. He gives away stuff like that. You should go. If you're interested in documentation, do go because I'm hoping to go in September and it really helps if you have at least two people from a project so you're not just the odd person out. Excellent. Uh, that's uh, Ryan, everybody. Not, a, not exactly a free BSD user, but close. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a good interchange <laughs> we've got going there, right? Yeah. And we need to encourage that. Uh, not, just, not just because we can benefit from it, but because other people can benefit from it in the other projects. And they like us, and we like them. Sean says thank you for the shout-outs, by the way. For the what? Oh, really? <laughs> OK. Tell him I'm sorry about you know complaining about ITS too long. <laughs> All right, I should have asked. Are we done with this? Does anybody have anything they want to say about this? Um, something we do in GNOME. I, I missed like the first half of this thing, so I don't know if it's been covered. Um, I sort of add up how we have talked about this, uh, and we found that a lot of things we just don't need to use in computers, like basically trapping your will to Linux. Um, and markup. That's a good, uh, a good point. The nice thing about, uh, and I've got the wiki on my next slide here, the nice thing about a wiki that's relatively open, I mean, not open to anyone to write in, but maybe all they need is an account, is that they do. Their, their work gets on there, or maybe, I think PCBSD, don't you uh, check it first, and then it's committed, like it appears the next day or something? It doesn't appear immediately. What? Oh, okay. Well, you used to, right? Somebody would review uh, entries before they were actually visible to the world. But yes, that's an excellent point because that instant gratification uh, is much more valuable than like submitting a PR. And then if you're lucky, six months later it gets committed and it's like, oh, great. I don't care now. Uh, and we do have a high amount of overhead for new contributors in knowing the, the markup because we have multiple kinds of markup which are totally unlike each other. Uh, Docbook XML, utterly different from MDoc. And don't we have something else? Seem like there's some other format, but uh, none of them have any relation to each other. And so if you're an expert in one, it doesn't help you at all. It's like, oh, well, <laughs> you, you know all about that? Well, doesn't matter. So yes, we need. Uh, we were just mentioned that a, a bit ago where we need some sort of an introductory thing for people, new committers, or not new committers, new contributors, so that they can contribute and get that feedback but aren't put off by our, uh, I don't know, how many chapters are there in the primer? It's at least 12. It's like, oh, you need to know all this. And we don't say that, but that's kind of what they, uh, many people read it as, see that as implied. Well, I need to know all this stuff, plus you need to know version control, maybe. Uh, yes, it is tremendously off-putting, and we need to get around that. So let's go on to this next slide, which has the wiki on there. Many people want to contribute. Uh, the FreeBSD laptop compatibility list, anybody remember that? It was awesome. Uh, it, it had its problems. Uh, there were spammers on it from time to time. And it didn't have the latest machines, or even ones that were relatively recent. But it was a, a web page you could go and look up a laptop and see how uh, FreeBSD ran on it. There was a, a thing of, that said whether or not Xorg worked on it, uh, what they used for devices, I mean device hardware, like if it had a Broadcom wireless or something. Um, they had a place where you could enter X, the Xorg conf file if it was needed, various other things like that. It was just really nice. And it went away once. I sent email to the webmaster at that place, and he contacted the guy who originally started, and they brought it back. This was years ago. And now it's gone away per permanently, which is bad. So we do have people who want to contribute laptop information. 
and a place on the wiki was created to do that. The problem is access. Uh, and I'm not talking about just the, uh, the laptop thing, but the wiki in general. Originally, it had you could sign up for an account, if I'm remembering this correctly, but there were something like 40 or 50,000 spam accounts being created every day, so that was disabled. And so now, it's extremely difficult to get an account on the wiki. And then, even if you get an account on the wiki, how do the rest of us assure that the information that's edited is, has some level of quality? I mean, if you get an account on the wiki, you're probably able to change about anything on the wiki, and that's not good. I mean, even by accident, changing things on there could be a bad thing. But uh, the answer is not to get rid of the wiki because it is something that's very accessible to people. And I don't know the answer about the access problem. But we need to do something with that because it is, it is a point that's important to people. And things like the laptop compatibility thing are very important and very valuable to the user community. So I don't know what we do, but we need to do something on that. Because if somebody enters something wrong or malicious, you have other users that correct it? Uh, yeah, but we've never encountered a case of somebody doing something accidentally malicious. Hmm. Um, and it'll be even you know, maybe something that we can correct. It'll be you know, maybe you say something wrong and somebody will come along and correct it. Um, and certainly having the lower barrier to entry improves people coming along and correcting it uh, and the limitations. Uh, but I, I don't, I, I mean, you know, I'm sure it exists, but I. Well, and in our case, it wasn't harm. I, I wasn't involved in that. This is just I'm the secondhand story I'm telling here. But yes, they, there was some sort of automated spam bot that would get on there and, oh, I'm getting accounts. Give me more. Give me thousands more. And it actually was slowing down the machine. It was that busy. Uh, and so that's why they disabled it. But maybe there's some sort of rate limiting thing you can have in the registration mechanism, uh, some, some technical way around that. Because we do have people, and, and also permissions. So it's like, OK, I will give you an account, and you get permissions to edit the laptop list, but not other areas. So yeah, for us, it's just like, you can do whatever you want. And that's our, that's our commit policy as well. Like, if you get a commit or account, even if it's someone you write documentation, you can make any progress. Uh -huh. The bots have become more sophisticated. It's a uh, it's a arms race. Yeah, it's uh, we've done some of the homework on stuff, and just the captcha and all these blacklists and all these. They're very motivated. But yes, we need to find a way around that because now, if you want an account on the wiki, you send an email to whoever is handling it today, which was Adrian last I saw, but that's not something that scales well having one person manually add accounts. Uh, it limits, it, it's a drag on them, plus also it limits the number of people who, real people who can sign up. There's just not enough bandwidth for that. So yes, we need to do something on that. I, I don't know if anybody's ever quoted me, but I've said it many times. Wikis are where documents go to die. It's like the elephant graveyard, because there's always something that's really outdated and should have been deleted long ago on there. But I say that mostly jokingly, but there are valid uses for them. The laptop compatibility thing is great. Uh, new code that hasn't yet been uh, thoroughly tested, uh, you might have manual pages or just uh, documentation on it in the wiki because it's preliminary and people need to give feedback on it. It's an excellent use for it. We need to have that. Uh, 
technically, I don't have suggestions on how to do that. I'm just pointing this out as a problem because there are many smart people in this room and smart people who will hopefully watch the video on YouTube and hopefully be able to hear what people have said through this mic. Uh, so talk, speak loudly if you can. Uh, and I'm hoping that by poking this proverbial ant nest with a stick, we will encourage people to try and overcome the difficulties and make it better for the users. Yes, it does have a tremendous amount of overhead to write. Uh, there are converters. The problem is DocBook has so many options that a simpler language that's written in and then converted to DocBook probably will not work anyway. And I don't really know what to do about that. My hope is that by using things like annotator and other simpler, uh, lowering the barriers to entry to begin working on documentation, we will get enough people who will be motivated to say, hey, you know, I would really like to edit this chapter in, in the handbook. And how do I do that? And oh, that's terrible. That's nasty. OK, but I'm really motivated to do that because of all this other stuff I've done has been successful. So I will learn that, and I will commit it. And then after you've done it a few times, it's not so bad. And then, of course, that person becomes a doc committer and takes on their own mentee. So. Uh, a little, and that I believe that's that's the GNOME doc system, but isn't it mostly aimed at doing uh, context-based help? Uh, well, topic-based help uh, in general. Right, but it's not it's not like a document, like a read-through, like the handbook. It's, uh, I think. But yes, I've looked at it. the 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 answer to the question is not really. True. Uh, like uh, most you sit down, you know, when you begin to be like, I think I'm going to go through the handbook, like, beginning to the end, right? Right, but it's, it's more of a serial organization than a random, uh, like a help file that takes you to a specific page, depending on what you're looking at in a UE. But yes, uh, there are other build systems. I think, uh, I suspect, that interaction with them is complicated by the same problems we have with PO files of we have a slightly customized docbook XML, we have some custom tags, uh, custom XML catalogs, and I suspect that with the same type of work we would do to create PO files, we can probably interact with those other document build systems. It's the same area. It's in the same state, if not necessarily the same city. Hmm. That even just that con conversion might be useful. So, yes, is, is that on? I, sorry, I can't see the notes. Somebody write that down. Mallard. And duck type. And duck type. Is that based on the the ducks in in Cincinnati? For those who don't know, the uh, uh, the aquatic buses. They load them up in Cincinnati. They load them up full of tourists, and they drive down the ramp at 20 or 30 miles an hour and plunge into the river. And all the tourists wear little hats with duck bills on them. They call those ducks the ducks. A load of tourists with the little duck hats is well worth seeing. Okay, so anything else to add on this? I don't, but I'm hoping. I'm hoping this grows in your mind as you, as you sleep and go about your other occupations and suddenly somebody goes, hey, you know we could. OK, I'll move on. The website. Incidentally, all these photos are photos I've taken. They're mostly from South Dakota, but just in case, because I once was accused of just grabbing images off the net, these are not off the net. These are mine. I took them. They vary in quality. Everything varies in quality. Oh, where do we begin with the website? Well, Alan was the one who wanted to talk about this. <laughs> let's, let's start with the simple stuff. Uh, 
the website has real discoverability problems. Most people don't know, or I shouldn't say most, many people do not know. that these little buttons at the top also do things. I mean, this is not just a menu for community where I can go down to these other choices. If I click on community, that takes me to a different thing than I would have expected. That, yeah, this is a discoverability problem. There are tons of things on here that many people don't know about at all. And even the ones that are obvious can be kind of hard to get to. Uh, for instance, uh, these, the manual pages thing, that is an awesome link. I send people from various other mailing lists that have nothing to do with FreeBSD there because you can look up Linux manual pages uh, and other things. And it's just, oh, let's say LS, whatever. Yeah, but that's another thing. What about adding um, semantic search? I mean, is that public now for sure. quite a bit or almost a year? Uh, the, well, I agree. I want that. The problem we have in the website is, the, uh, well, there are several. You, uh, avoiding the user issues. Mostly what I'm talking about is the problems with replacing it wholesale. Is the existing website, like many things, is kind of a legacy thing. It's grown over the years. There are CGI scripts. There's CSS. Uh, a bunch of things. And so it all ties together. And so a replacement would have to tie into those. I believe these are all generated manually by, uh, I can't remember his name. Wolfram yes, yes. Uh, Wolfram Schneider, right? OK. And he generates these. Not only does he generate the man pages for the operating system, he manually generates the man pages. Watch, watch this fail, because it's probably not in there. But the man pages for the operating system and ports. No, not that one. Oh, no, it's not Snapshort. I mean, how do you generate the man pages for the ports? You build every port. I'm impressed, not impressed, I'm astounded by the dedication that takes. But look at how useful that is. It, the rendering is beautiful. It's easier to read than on a terminal. And yet, how many people even know this is here? Okay, but, 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 <laughs> yes, those are details, but we're, ta we're, we're talking about the idea. So yes, in the specifics, it could be polished. But in the idea of having all these web pages online, have you looked at the list of these things? I mean, it goes back forever. And look at these, CentOS. So if you have a, in many cases, the same commands have different options between Linux and FreeBSD. There's a comparison right there. It's like, well, I don't have a Linux system handy because I never do, but I can look on here and see what that option translates to in FreeBSD. Or, oh man, what else is in here? Everything, Darwin, Debian. Uh, isn't OpenBSD in here? It, these are alphabetical, so I think it is. Uh, Okay, but this is an example of one of the really cool things we have on our website that I can't prove it, but I can say with some certainty that it is underutilized. And if people knew about it, it would get more use and they would like it. And that's what we want. It would also be an excellent target for this annotated JS thing because we were talking previously about the difficulty of you know, getting a man page written when you don't want to start in Docker. You don't use it very often. But of course, the real problem is 
maintaining it and reading <coughs> the MDoc format is even less fun. Yes. So, uh, almost any document that's had markup in it is not pleasant. But, you know, the annotate JS thing on this would be fantastic. Sure. Well, okay, now, the web page, as far as an overview, it's got lots of functions that are not discoverable. One reason they are not discoverable is because of the design, which was redone, what, 10 years ago now? Wow. It's, it's been quite a while. It's been longer than it seems, let's put it that way. And the design is somewhat dated, and it bothers me that I have a nice wide screen, but the style at the time was to squish down and just leave blank borders. At one point, I was go going to do an E. Adler commit, which is where I I stomped through the CSS, and anything that said 50% or so, I just changed to 90. And just, I edited the hell out of it, and suddenly it filled my screen, and I was going to do an eAdler commit, which, as I define it is, you say, on IRC, you get on IRC and say, I'm about to do this commit of the CSS that changes the, the width of the screen. If nobody complains in the next 30 seconds, off it goes. <laughs> no? Okay, there it goes. But I didn't. Uh, I delayed for a while. It wasn't quite complete. There were some things that didn't render right, and so I didn't want to make it worse than it was. Uh, in the meantime, Alan uh, helped me with that some, and also um, Cynthia, no, Claudia. Claudia Yudathi, does anybody know her? She's, she works for Norse, like everybody works for Norse now, right? Uh, no. <laughs> almost everybody. And it's just a matter of time, really. <laughs> but I, I think I have her name right, uh, Claudia Yadathi. And she worked for Norse and contacted, uh, I believe, John Baldwin. And she had a sample redesign of the website, uh, which looked pretty good. And I'd show it to you, except several months after that, it, the demo went away. And I asked them, but they didn't put it back. So. Well, and it was funny because they had it online at a site that was like free BDS. It looked like free BSD in your head, and you had to type it wrong. But it, like I say, it's no longer there. But the, the, that was a thing where they worked on it, and we needed to have a meeting or something and talk about it. And I think they kind of lost interest, and we kind of lost that opportunity. But. This is always a sore point. I think it's one of those things where, as the documentation team, we just need to say, hey, it's our domain. We're going to change it. It, it. People can complain if they want, but. Again. Well, and with our, I think that would be excellent. And one of the problems with this is it is so jammed with stuff. The worse it gets. <laughs> It's, it's, it's been an issue for a long time, and it does need to be done. So yes, certainly we should talk about that. And just for one quick second, I want to show you, unless they've changed it, the uh, Web2Py. Are you familiar with that? Anybody? It's a Python web framework. No, they've changed it. Never mind. It was my uh, example of a website that was good, because you went to it, and it had uh, just three or four things to click on. And it was all organized under that. Th this one, I mean, where do you start? Pull up from FBSD is, is very good. Is it? 
Does it have their flag on it still? That's not bad. Uh, it's, it's still kind of busy, I would say, because it's not clear to me where I go so much, but it's better than ours. Let's put it that way. But this is, this is one of the reasons the web redesign is always a fight, because everybody has an idea of what it should be. And it's one of those, uh, I forget what it's called, the term, if you have an extremely difficult technical problem, it's easy to make a decision and go with it, because there's very few people arguing with you. If it's a non-technical problem, like what a website should look like, everybody's going to argue. Like yes. Like but, the, but, well, I thought there was some, like, scientific name for it. But it doesn't matter. That's the, that's the issue. And, yes, uh, it needs it, because the fact that you can go to our web page and not find what you're looking for and not even realize that what you're looking for is there, that's a real problem. And like I say, the bike shed issue, okay. Let's just say, hey, the website belongs to documentation, which I think is true. Uh, we're going to change it. Uh, and of course, the uh, cluster administrators have to be involved with that because there are scripts that build things that are seen on here that, I mean, uh, not just the man page thing, which is a manual one, but automatic cron jobs that rebuild like the PDF version of the handbook. And so that's going to be a job to integrate that. But uh, anyway, that's what I wanted to say about this. Now Alan's back. Yes, because you made me put this on the, on the schedule. Although rightly, rightly so, the website, the things that are wrong with it. It might be quicker to detail what is right with it. And am I right? It was Claudia Yudathi, right? I, I, our, our sin, I, I think it's Claudia. Uh, yes. Uh, she had a redesign that looked pretty good. Uh, there are a few tweaks to make, but nothing major. Uh, and the main point of it that I saw was that it made the, the introduction, the f opening page, much easier to, s to tell what you were going. It was much simpler. Do we have a preview of that? No. They took it down. I mean, I asked them to put it back up because I wanted to talk to some other uh, big names and say, hey, what do you think of this? But they, I think they, they ran out of time to work on it or something. I, I can't speak for them. But they, they did a good initial start on it. And I'm sure it's still available. And they were willing to let us use it. On the other hand, uh, Anne brought up the idea that the foundation is having their website redesigned again uh, yes, or make it similar. And if, if, if somebody's working on that, it's like, hey, I have all these graphics and things. Well, we want it like that, but with the little demon horns or something. You know, have it similar, but maybe not identical. And that might be a way to take advantage of that existing work. But yes, the, we have lots of really cool stuff that's on here. Uh, there is poor organization, which just needs to be redone, like the documentation. Um, what was it I'm thinking of? All the books and articles. There is no order to this. I mean, I'm interested in, a, say, what has it got to say about file systems? I don't know. It's not in any sorted order or uh, grouped by subject or anything at all. Well, just, just look at the first one, a project model for the FreeBSD project. That's not something that anyone that's coming to this web page for the first time wants to see. It, right. It, it doesn't make sense. And if you're looking for something in here, the, the order they're in doesn't help. But again, and, and this is just an example of things that we need to improve. And if we're redoing the website, that's a good time to re, redo these. Does anybody have any feedback on the download page changes I made? Did anyone notice? <coughs> I don't know. Here? Most of us don't download it. And, all right. I use right. the FTP URLs off the top of my head. FTP? I use SVN. Yes, Alan did make a lot of nice improvements to this, and we hounded him endlessly about multiple changes. But it is far clearer now of where you get these. It's it's a big improvement over the way it was. Oh, uh, imagine there was this much more screen showing here. 
Yeah. Okay. But Good enough then. Yeah. So but the problem with the website is basically that it's very much tied to our current documentation, build infrastructure, and we need people that do the design and the layout and all. Of so website's a huge thing, and if you want to have backend systems like CSS or something, that needs some people to take care of that. Right, and that involves the cluster admins too. If if we're going to have stuff like that, because of course the at least Apache runs there, and if we're going to add other software, they need to deal with that. Or whatever. Or Nginx, whatever, a web server. <laughs> I, it's a generic term for me. I, I would say, if I were you, don't wait for freebsd.org. Well, but, okay, but, I, but don't, don't, go, don't right. go dynamic for that. I mean, most of right. the content can be generated just from, it is currently generated from XML files. But if we were to move to a statically built uh, website, I mean, it could be enough. Uh, WordPress is has a lot of overhead. Right. Well, and there would have to be. There would have to be buy-in by the cluster administrators and all that, but the does, yeah, anyway. right. But but that's an implementation detail. The important thing here is, even if the the foundation got a new website uh, and FreeBSD itself did not use the the underlying layer, the underlying software, you'd still have what I consider the hard stuff to do, which is the layout, the graphics, the design, you know, the how it looks, yeah. because. That's hard. I mean, people who do that are, are big money and do it well. What we managed to do is have the front page and a couple of pages that need to be updated frequently by possibly people that aren't familiar with the doc build system be from a CMS, but the download page can still be generated by a make file so that Glenn is happy with, you know, I, I, entities that auto populate and there's like code that deals with when, when a beta is happening, when a release candidate how many branches there are, it's all there, we don't have to throw that away. I would like to suggest one thing which might be impractical but I think is a cool idea. I would like to see the content and the, the presentation separated so essentially we would have a skin for this. Why does it have to be the same? What if the FreeBSD website looked different once a week? Uh, if the, the content is separated from the presentation, you can do that. And you could even do <laughs> what? I personally think it would be kind of cool if it wasn't always the same. I mean, it's like, OK, it's still the FreeBSD page, but the colors are different for this week. Or things, uh, the logo is different, you know? OK. Does somebody have some water? Well, but the, 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 one of the important advantages of that is then changing it. All our content would still be there, but we could refine it. Like, uh, for instance, my, my bit with the CSS, where it was limiting the width of the text on, to, on my widescreen to the middle third. We could change all that without having to mess with the content. We could fix issues like that. Yes. And they are not now. Uh, there's a lot of, there's yeah. static HTML, there's Perl, there's CGI scripts, there's generated HTML, I believe. Uh, yeah, and there's a lot of stuff in there. And none of it is really, it's all been added to. Online man pages. It would be 
tedious but straightforward to create manpages.freebsd.org and break up the job into smaller pieces? Well, that's, that's a good idea. You could do that with the main page, have the main page be an introductory thing with like five icons, you know, yes. uh, community, you know, whatever. And then just have it send all these. Now there are, if you look at the domains on these, it does actually have those subdomains. I couldn't tell you exactly where they are. Uh, I don't want that any of those. If I go here, that's here. docs. There is, I can't, couldn't tell you exactly what there are, but the do, there are different domains Here's prefixes for that. Right. The important thing is that the right. I'm not. I, I'm much. I, I'm much more concerned about the appearance to the user than how it's generated underneath, and, and that I think is our major problem. Because, well, uh, somebody who I won't name, but somebody. I showed them that uh, documentation thing that you could actually click on that link mm -hmm. instead of going to one of these entries in the menu. And they were long, long time FreeBSD users said, I didn't, never knew that, never seen it. But also that means it doesn't work on a touch screen, like a phone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then there you're going to the whole mobile site thing, which we ought to have also. I think that's configurable. I think that's configurable in the uh, XSLT stuff. <laughs> Those are details, again, implementation details. The problem is that our website is not serving either the FreeBSD community or prospective FreeBSD users very well. And we can do better, and we need to do better on it. I would say, well, it's primarily documentation owns the website. It's built through the doc tools, uh, but it interacts with the core admins, and so I don't know how you derive that. Maybe, maybe doc engineering. May I suggest to put down a team of volunteers, both doc hang and doc committers especially, sit down, go to core, go to, write down the proposal. Yes. Well, uh, is, uh, is somebody putting this down in the etherpad? Someone is doing that. Just get a small team of volunteers to actually do it and get a proposal worked out. Yeah, I think that's excellent. Has somebody put that in the etherpad thing? Because we need that. I agree. That is the way we should do that. And as far as buy in, I think in previous attempts, there has been. If you're familiar with FARC, FARC.com, F-A-R-K, they changed their website several years ago and people complained and they said, you'll get used to it. It was kind of a brutal thing and it turned out they did get used to it. So. If we don't do that, we're gonna sit here in 10 years and have the same website. And the same exact website. Well, by then, you know, your phone will be inside your head. So it's like. Oh, I see that. Okay. Oh, there's the man pages. All right. Uh, can we also, when we put the committee together, add a deadline? I mean, we can all, I'm happy to come up on the agency side. That's, that's, anything, so we can that's an excellent idea because. So I can keep saying hello? Yes. 
Without a deadline, it may never happen. So yes, it, on the, the ether pad. Okay. But the bit about the bit about how Anne has helpfully volunteered to do the hard work for us and also that it needs a deadline. Well, and speaking of foundation work, there are it's possible that for content and front page things like the foundation produced little look, this company TV previous D or previous D journal or whatever. There's lots of stuff out there that would make you say, Oh, look, this is an exciting community of people who are doing interesting things. I want this. Yes. Um, uh, there was something like that on that web 2 pi page, which is why I'm sad that it didn't get to it. Oh, well, we'll live. But yes, but the only thing I'd say is let's not have one of those big scrolling pictures. I hate those. Okay. I, that's a marketing thing. I know marketing people love those, but... Right. Well, and if it's, if it's done well and documented, uh, the process, I mean, then even if everybody is unhappy about the replacement web page, the procedure is there to redo it by somebody else. Because say, OK, well, we did this hard work of getting it to this stage. <laughs> Here you go. Now you're the new group of volunteers, and you can refine it. And that way, the community would get some feedback if they didn't like it. So all right. So. Yes, there are a lot of details, and everybody has the, the bike shed thing about how the website looks. Uh, shall we go on to our final topic, which is other topics? Green, please. I want it green. Oh, okay. <laughs> we'll do that. Uh, all right. I know that uh, Christian had a, okay, just a second. Let me, oops, go back to my slide, because it's important. It's not really, it's not important. There. That was in Nebraska, by the way. Uh, OK. Uh, Christian wanted to talk about, uh, I forget. The release documentation. OK. So there's another part of the whole documentation uh, ecosystem that gets even less love than the rest, I suppose. And that's the release documentation. And, um, one of the issues is that it currently lives within the source tree instead of the doc tree. And there's a lot of bike shedding you can do around that. But one of the biggest problems to me is that it basically means that the release documentation is static. So once a release happens, it's only HTML and it doesn't ever get changed. Well, that's that's yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, it's kind of then tagged. The generated version is the new again. It's, it's basically tagged with the, with the same tag as, as the, the whole release. And the problem with that is that it's, um, we can't fix things after the fact. So there was one example recently where a vendor uh, kind of sent an email to the doc or www list saying that um, a driver that's actually in the tree wasn't, wasn't mentioned in the, the hardware documentation. And the only answer we can give to that is, oh, we'll add it to the errata document, which of course no one ever reads. So that's effectively useless. So um, I don't see any good reason to for the release documentation to stay in the source tree. It's not like the, I'm sure the Glenn doesn't care which tree it goes in. Yeah. Uh, Sorry? I'm sure Glenn doesn't care if it goes in. Oh, Glenn, Glenn is, the, is, is the table of this. And I right. think he proposed this at BSD CAN last year or two years ago, but apparently there was a lot of people complaining about it. So I, we didn't want to have anything to do with it this time. I <laughs> think. Uh, and we'll just come up with a hazard thing. Well, and I think uh, uh, a couple of years ago here, GNN really said it where it's like, as far as Core is concerned, 
uh, the doc team owns the documents and can do whatever they see fit. I'm paraphrasing, but that's, and at some point, I think it's like the they'll get used to it thing. There's some things that just need to be done, and granted, people will not be happy with it, but people are not happy with it already, so, you know, you've already got people offended on both sides, so when it's done, at least those people will be happy. So there are many things like that where it's better off to do that and just get it over with. Uh, sorry, is it noon? How did that happen? Are, are we out of time? Well, okay. Uh, just I don't want any of you to miss lunch, and I've seen the way people go through those lines here. So <laughs> it's like keep your hands away from their mouths. Uh, is there, I, I'm sorry to cut you short. I'm sure there's more that needs to be said on that, but. Uh, oh, really. It's just seeing what's the general opinion about that. I think uh, I'm okay with that because I don't like that idea of the release notes being cast in stone mm -hmm. when they've got errors in them. I mean, yeah. I, that should be corrected. Now, accountants like that kind of thing. That's where you make a new entry that undoes the bad old one. Mm -hmm. well, isn't that yeah, that, and that's a good point. Very few people read those. So anyway, OK, final comments from anybody? Uh, yes? Flask is another one of those small frameworks. Uh, it would probably, for, for that particular group of people, would probably be an unhappy middle ground. But yes, maybe there is a, a compromise that can be reached amongst all of those. Uh, I don't personally really care what it runs underneath as long as it is easy to use. And that's, uh, if, if a framework like that makes it easier and the cluster admins agree that it's safe enough to run, I'm for that. That's, yeah. That is a good thing. Of course, we would have another markup system. <laughs> oh, yes. The, uh, the doc lounge or doc group will be here, not in, in this room, but in one of these rooms. I think the main one. Uh, from starting at 6 tonight, if you're interested in documentation, show up. Uh, we will talk about things. We will try and give a few short examples. And uh, Ingo will be there. And who was it who, who wanted to talk to him about the, uh, oh, it was Baptiste. He stopped me in the hallway. He would be there. He, yes, he really, he wants to talk to you tonight. And we can, if somebody has a question about